Once they roamed the great plains of the American Midwest in their millions, from the Rockies to the Mississippi, from Canada to Mexico, until settlers arrived and the plains became a killing field. In 1870, hunters got $3.25 for a buffalo hide. The carcasses were left to rot. The effect was devastating. Towards the end of the 19th century, the bison was nearly extinct. Of the 50 million which once roamed America, only 800 were left alive. Today, nearly 150 years later, scientists consider the near annihilation of the bison to be the most costly mistake in US history. What can America do? Is there any hope that one day huge herds of buffalo will roam the plains again? The white settlement of the Great Plains was, quote, the largest, longest running agricultural and environmental mis miscalculation in American history. What's happened in the plains over the last 20 years in terms of the continued depopulation of the region, young people leaving, the region becoming older, uh, increased erosion, the dropping of the soil, uh, the dropping of the groundwater tables, and the increase of agricultural subsidies to support this fiasco, I think proves our point. Buffalo Commons, a land only for buffalo, a land where they can roam and live freely, a land which belongs to the people but is left to the bison, just like it was in the days before the settlers arrived. Phyllis Bell, a journalist from Lebanon, knows that her town has no future. Phyllis takes a break from chronicling life in the town to visit her parents' house. This was built by my grandfather, William Schroeder, in 1875 from cottonwood trees. He came uh, to the United States from Prussia, and he settled in New York for five years, and when they opened up the homesteads for 160 acres, why, he decided to come out here. The Homestead Act was the biggest government land settling project in American history. Free land was offered to settlers so that the plains could be colonized and the Native Americans driven away. The race was on to establish new homes and new lives. Each settler received 160 acres of prairie land as a gift. The first to ram his fence post into a patch of prairie became the proud owner of that piece of land. Plowing started right away so that cornfields could replace the wild buffalo grass. It was a huge mistake. The grass's long roots were the only thing keeping the prairie's sandy soil anchored in place. Plowing the prairies sowed the seeds of a disaster. Equipment abandoned by settlers from Germany, Scandinavia, and Ireland still litters the plains. Silent relics from a failed colonization. The settlers' dream of fertile farmland finally ended with an unprecedented sandstorm which swept across the country in the 1930s. I lived here during the, the drought and the Dust Bowl days. I was uh, first grade, I think, was and I was walking home one day from school and I thought it seemed kind of strange. No one had seen a storm like the Great Dust Bowl before. In 1930, prairie sand was whipped up by the wind and carried the breadth of the country all the way to New York and far across the Atlantic Ocean.
that night the, the wind came up and blew some dust in and uh, we had to take a, a light to, to see our way to bed and we covered our faces up with wet cloths so as not to breathe so much of the dust. And we had so much dust blow that it covered the fences up and I didn't have to crawl through the fence when I went back to school. I could just walk right over it. So that caused a lot of farmers uh, to that rented ground to leave to find uh, jobs in other places. A lot of them went to Oregon and California and places like that. 50 years ago or more, we had like 700 people in our town and now it's down to about 250. It's been a, you know, it's been gradual over the years, but every year we have a census, it's always down. The 777 Ranch was one of the first ranches to successfully switch from raising cattle to raising bison instead. In Frank and Deborah Popper's eyes, the 777 is a prototype for the possible economic regeneration of the whole of the plant. Over the past 20 years, the Poppers have watched as buffalo grass has once again spread across the plains. Each blade of grass has roots stretching about six feet. One square yard of grass equals several miles of roots, keeping the sandy soil anchored in place. Thanks to the grass roots, there will never be another dust bowl. Buffalo Commons, land of the buffalo. And as buffalo return to the plains, so do other species. Prairie dogs were nearly exterminated by cattle ranchers because of the fear that their burrow holes could trip and break the cattle's legs. But for the huge bison, the tiny holes caused no problems. Close to the 777 ranch are the fabled Badlands. This is the hallowed place where, according to Lakota mythology, the buffalo descended from the spirit world to offer himself as food to the humans. It is still a place where Native Americans thank their creator in a holy ceremony. Native Americans of the plains were once totally dependent on the success of the buffalo hunt. Besides food, the animals provided the raw materials for clothes and footwear, weapons, tools and teepees. Even their droppings were a priceless source of fuel in the fast, tree-free plains. Surviving on the prairies requires a complete, efficient use of every resource, for humans and animals alike. Although the Badlands are extremely dry, millions of buffalo once lived here. Bison, unlike imported foreign cattle, make much more efficient use of the scarcest water supply. Native Americans call the buffalo bull Tatanka the holiest animal of the Lakota, Dakota, and Cheyenne tribes, weighs nearly a ton. The number of Native Americans living on the plains has steadily grown since the buffalo's return. Every year, many Native Americans celebrate the battles won in the wars against the white settlers, like the Battle of Little Bighorn. On July 25, 1876, the Lakota and the Cheyenne beat the white invaders under the leadership of legendary chiefs Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse. But after Little Bighorn, the U.S. Army fought even harder to force the remaining Lakota and Cheyenne onto reservations. Jay Redhawk is proud to be a Lakota. Wanji, Numpa, Yamni. Yamni. One, two, three. Jay Redhawk is one of the first Lakota in modern times to hunt buffalo with a bow and arrow. In two years' time, his eldest son will join him. There you go. Jay Redhawk teaches his sons to be prepared for when their quarry approaches by placing their arrows in the ground and setting their bow on top. Here, the Army and the United States government, it was policy, General Sherman, wrote a letter to General to President Grant, who's on the $50 bill. He said, if you want to exterminate the Sioux, kill the buffalo. They did it on purpose. They killed, they murdered our relatives first, and then they murdered us. 
and the population of the buffalo is going to depend on how many Lakotas there are, how many Dakotas there are, how many Cheyennes there are. That's the way it is. When there's a lot of buffalo, there's a lot of us. Okay? And so for a long time, there was very little buffalo, and there were very few Lakotas. And now, the buffalo are coming back in your lifetime, in your generation. And the Lakota are coming back, and the Cheyenne are coming back. There's more buffalo, and there's more of us. And so what's going to happen? We have to hunt that buffalo and respect it, do all the ceremonies and pray and respect it so that it always comes back and feeds us. Because we believe when we kill a buffalo, where does he go? Uh -uh. To spirit world. And he tells the other buffalo, what does he tell them? Does he tell them if we're treating them good or not? And if, they, if he says they're treating us good down there, the Lakotas and Shans are treating us good, what do the buffalo in the spirit world tell that buffalo? Um, go, back and be born. go back and be born again and feed the people so they can live. Buffalo Bill a memorial in Kansas. One with a built-in radio station. It's not the buffalo which are honored, but William Cody, otherwise known as Buffalo Bill. The man the Kansas Pacific Railroad employed to supply workers with buffalo meat. By his own count, he killed 4,280 bison in just 17 months. If there is a buffalo capital in the United States, it's Rapid City, South Dakota. The Prairie Edge grew on the side of a closed liquor store in the center of town. The shop is part of the 777 Ranch and specializes in selling anything buffalo. Native American artists were welcome at the Prairie Edge from the day it opened. This was a place where they were paid fairly for their traditional art. The most common design now, as then, is the sacred bison. As the buffalo return to the plains, so do the Native Americans. Jay Redhawk, the Lakota, is hard at work making bows and arrows for the prairie edge. A few years ago, he came from the west to South Dakota to live in the sacred home of his ancestors. This way of life that's happening nowadays is a very destructive way of life. And now our buffalo hunting grounds are Super Walmart. This is where we see all our relatives on the prairie, in Super Walmart. This is where we get our meat and our pop and our chips and our food. And this is why we have diabetes, heart disease, and all these types of things, kidney problems. So during the winter, uh, we'll hunt deer with rifle or bow. We hunt buffalo. And sometimes nowadays we have to buy the buffalo and we'll go to a ranch like Dan O'Brien's, who's a good man and he really supports uh, us trying to have our traditional culture. But he gives us a good deal and we go down there and we shake hands and we work together. We'll hunt the buffalo and the whole family will pitch in the money and then we'll butcher it. We don't go to a butcher, huh? we do it ourselves. Never once have I been sick from a deer or an elk or an antelope or a buffalo that I've butchered. But I've been sick from McDonald's and Jack in the Box and all these places, Burger King, all that. Millions of buffalo once lived on these vast plains, but the bison are returning. Once again, a rarely seen courtship ritual lights up the plains the dance of the bull. 120 years ago, just 800 were left alive. The species was nearly exterminated in just 30 years. And now, the fact that today nearly 150,000 bison exist can be credited to the initiative of just a few. The return of the buffalo happened without any government backing. Millions of bison roaming the plains again? Why not? Twenty years ago, it seemed impossible to dream of thousands. Now that dream is a reality. As the buffalo slowly return to their rightful home, it's hoped humans will follow. <laughs>